Welcome to another video in this series on J. Gresham Machen's classic work, Christianity and Liberalism. We've already seen an introduction to the book, a few of its key themes, and a summary of chapter one. So now we are on to chapter two. Now this video, of course, will make more sense if you've already watched the other ones, and particularly if you've read uh, chapter two. It's one of the longer chapters in the book, but don't be put off by that. It's, it's well worth the read. Uh, as always, be sure to share your comments and questions below, uh, and we will start with an outline of chapter two. So, Machen's second chapter is called Doctrine, and it begins by showing some of the ways that liberals try to distance themselves from what they consider to be a distasteful concept, this concept of doctrine. Machen points out their inconsistency, after all, they have doctrines too. And then he turns to examine their primary claim, that Christianity was founded as a non-doctrinal religion. He examines the question in three ways. First, in the writings of Paul, Machen finds a clear emphasis on correct doctrine, particularly in the way that Paul deals with the theological controversies in Galatia and Philippi. Second, against those who would try to distinguish the teaching of Paul from that of the rest of the disciples, Machen demonstrates that the earliest apostles and missionaries did not call mankind to piety like the liberals would prefer, but rather they, like Paul, proclaimed a historical event, he is risen. And third, against those who would say that the apostles completely misunderstood the religion that Jesus taught, Machen argues that Jesus himself believed that to that he was to play a vital role in the salvation of his people. This messianic consciousness cannot be legitimately removed from the text as much as liberals might desire to do so. Machen then turns to the question of practicality. If Christianity were a non-doctrinal religion, could it possibly save us? Machen argues that liberal faith is merely faith in the memory of Jesus, not unlike the faith of the disciples immediately following the crucifixion of Jesus, in which they despaired and hid themselves. In contrast, true faith in Jesus depends on believing the historical fact of the resurrection, which transformed the apostles into bold evangelists. Finally, the chapter closes with a reply to common criticisms of his emphasis on doctrine. Machen first defends the importance of the Christian life, arguing that it is a natural outflow of Christian doctrine. And second, Machen recognizes that not all doctrines are of equal importance. True Christians can divide over serious theological disagreements while recognizing each other as brothers in Christ. But liberalism and its denial of the biblical testimony of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, says Machen, is not Christianity at all. All right, so much for an outline of the chapter. We're going to now look at four different areas, a uh, little bit of historical context. We'll start with uh, the origin of Paul's religion. Where did Paul's religion come from? Was the Apostle Paul an innovator, a founder of a new religion, as many liberal theologians argued? Or did he believe and teach the same things that the original apostles believed and taught, which they had learned directly from Jesus? Much rides on this answer. If Paul's faith must be held in tension with the faith of the other apostles, Christians would be wrong to rely so heavily on, for example, Paul's letter to the Romans. Recognizing the danger here, Machen devoted much of his early academic career to this question, where did Paul's faith come from? Modernists of different stripes had developed several theories that served to undermine the authority and relevance of Paul. One argued that Paul never believed in a supernatural Jesus at all, just the good teacher Jesus. Another held that Paul's religion was based on pre-Christian Jewish, Jewish conceptions of who the Messiah would be. And a third suggested that Paul derived his faith mainly from pagan influences. Machen demonstrates serious deficiencies in all three of these theories in his 1921 book, The Origin of Paul's Religion. To him, the only viable explanation for Paul's transformation from enemy to follower of Christ is found in the New Testament record. His relationship to Jesus was deeply personal and founded on what Christ did for him. That is, he loved me and gave himself for me, as he wrote in Galatians 2.20. This is the basis of Paul's faith and the basis of true Christianity. 
Now, on the topic of biblical criticism. For many Christians, questioning the truthfulness of the contents of the Bible is practically unthinkable. Such Christians may wonder at Machen's use of the term radical criticism and his apparent willingness to set aside the Gospel of John in his explanation of the message of Jesus. But we have to back up a little bit. In the 19th century, the field of biblical criticism grew in prominence as scholars sought to apply scientific methods of analysis to the study of the Bible. Many of these intellectuals were naturalistic, operating on the assumption that supernatural occurrences were impossible, so they challenged the authenticity of the text we have today. They developed theories to ostensibly strip away the contamination and uncover the truth hidden below the surface. Discovering the true Jesus, the historical Jesus supposedly concealed by the current text of the Bible, was their key goal. Liberal theologians expected to find that Jesus was nothing more than a simple teacher who never actually sought to make his own person or his death of any real significance. John's Gospel and its high Christology thus had to be discarded, typically in favor of a theory identifying Mark and a hypothetical Q document to be the most reliable texts. But even the most radical criticism of this type, Machen says, does not resolve the issue. Even in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus clearly puts himself at the center of his gospel and is nothing like the mere teacher of ethical principles that liberals desire. Jesus' awareness of his own role in the salvation of his people, that is, his messianic consciousness, permeates the texts and cannot be simply explained away. Okay, a few comments now on Machen and ecumenism. In the last major section of this chapter, Machen emphasizes the common ground that he, as a Presbyterian Calvinist, shares with other historic Christian traditions. Machen certainly deserves his reputation as a staunch defender of doctrinal purity, but he was not unwilling to regard those in other traditions as brothers in Christ. Machen's antagonism to ecumenical efforts first flared in the controversy over the 1920 Plan of Union, an attempt to combine a variety of denominations so as to present a united face to the world. Machen was adamantly opposed to the plan, particularly because its basis for unity was a creed so bare and vague that even naturalistic liberals who rejected the gospel could honestly affirm it. At root was Machen's opposition to doctrinal indifferentism. Many in his denomination downplayed or ignored the theological differences that Machen insisted compromised the integrity of the church. Much preferable, he says, is open and honest recognition of disparity of views, even when this results in division in the church. And now, a few comments on Machen and fundamentalism. Though Machen was often identified as a fundamentalist, uh, he always preferred to be known as a Calvinist. The, the term fundamentalist was useful in that it served as a clear contrast to the modernist liberalism that Machen so strenuously opposed, but both culturally and theologically, it was not adequate to describe him. First, culturally, Machen did not fit the revivalist, anti-intellectual, and teetotaling fundamentalist stereotype. His family moved in high social circles, he was a well-regarded scholar, and he opposed the prohibition of alcohol and other uses of government power to impose morality. The theological differences, though, were at least as pronounced. In Christianity and liberalism, this is most obvious when Machen criticizes dispensationalism, a theological framework popularized by fundamentalist Bible teachers like Dwight Moody and C.I. Schofield. Other fundamentalist distinctives, like the end times and creationism, were secondary issues for Machen and rarely discussed in his writings. Instead, as the contents of Christianity and liberalism show, Machen's focus in the struggle against liberalism was the gospel itself, the supernatural God-man, Jesus Christ, his atoning death on the cross, and his bodily resurrection from the dead. All right, we'll close then with a few study questions. First, According to Machen, why are creeds so valuable? Second, what is wrong with the idea that Christianity is a life? Third, what is the basis for the difference in Paul's approach in the letters to Philippi and Galatia? Why was he tolerant toward one church and not the other? Four, how would the apostles and earliest church fathers have behaved after Jesus' death if Jesus came only to teach about ethics and inner spiritual life? And five, what is the difference between trust and reverence? 
You'll find the answers to questions like these in the book itself, so be sure to pick up a copy and read chapter two if you haven't already. With that, we'll close this episode in this series on Christianity and liberalism. We'll come back next time with a video on chapter three. Until then, be sure to like this video and subscribe uh, to the channel so that you don't miss more content like this. Thanks for watching.